If you're anything like me, a middle-aged man with ridiculously amazing hair, you've been around the block. You graduated college, entered the workforce, and for the last several decades, toiled and wrestled with the realities of life. And you've learned some hard-earned lessons. Lessons you didn't learn in college, but maybe hope you did. So in that spirit, in today's video, I want to go over 10 life skills that college doesn't teach you, but are crucial to successfully navigating our complex world. Hi, if you're new to the channel, my name is Tay from Financial Tortoise, where we learn to grow our wealth slow and steady. Number one, how to effectively manage your money. Let me be blunt here. Your college doesn't care about how you manage your money. You know why? Because they need your money. Whether you went to your state's public university like myself, a private liberal arts college, or something in between, colleges and universities are businesses. And in order to stay in business, they need to make money. They're incentivized to charge as much as they can. If that means you walk out with $100,000 in student loans, then be it. And I'm not here to say we should be angry at colleges for doing this. I'm just stating the reality. The responsibility to manage our money during and after college is up to us. It does no good to blame our college for our six-figure debt or our lack of knowledge about budgeting. What matters is what we're going to do about it. And learning how to manage our money isn't rocket science. I learned it well into my 30s, and if I could do it, you can too. So let me share with you three of my money principles. One, develop a strong aversion to debt. This isn't a popular stance, but I firmly believe that debt is not a wealth building tool. For most people, it is actually a wealth destroyer. Debt by nature increases our ability to buy more things which in turn increases lifestyle purchases, and in the long run, keeps us enslaved to debt obligations. If you live your life being comfortable with debt, it will be extremely hard to build sustainable wealth. Two, always aim to spend less than you earn. When you have a low overhead, this is your greatest weapon that you can use to ride out the uncertainties of life. You lose your job? No problem. You can stretch out your cash for at least six months until you find your next job. If you have low overhead because you condition yourself to always live below your means, you have flexibility to adjust. Your risk is naturally mitigated because you don't have major liabilities. Third, use a simple, broad market index fund as your primary wealth building tool. Too many people get too fancy with their investments too quickly and too early. Yes, there are times for dabbling in interesting cool investments like apartment complexes, rare watches, and startups. However, these all come after one has built a strong foundation of wealth. Wealth based on very boring and very simple broad market index funds. There is so much power to holding a giant basket of just about every US stock that people underestimate. And if you can follow these three money principles, you're essentially in a better financial position than 95% of people out there. Number two, how to manage our health. Roughly two out of three American adults are overweight, and one out of three are obese. And this isn't just a US problem. One of the most recent global estimates found that almost 10% of men and 14% of women in the world are obese, nearly double the rate of obesity in 1980. Unless you're a nutrition or a kinesiology major, the fact is that you likely never learn much about nutrition, diet, or appropriate exercise in school. The following are four health habits that have really helped me to maintain my health and my sanity into my 40s. One, proper sleep. It's so easy to push our sleep time to later and later at night, and Netflix doesn't help in this regard. Therefore, I force myself to be in bed by at least 10 p.m. every night, weekdays and weekends. A method that has really helped me is to have no electronic device like my iPad or my iPhone in my bedroom. Instead, I have an analog alarm clock and my Kindle e-reader on my bedstand. There's nothing like a good old book to help you fall asleep and good old alarm clock to help you wake up. Two, minimize processed foods from our diet. If it didn't grow from a tree or came from an animal in that form, I try not to eat it. Of course, this isn't always the case 100% of the time. I try to follow the 80-20 rule. As long as I can get 80% of my diet from healthy whole foods, I feel like I'm winning. Three, physical activity. Get at least 30 minutes of physical activity per day. I like weight training, but any activity is good. As long as you fulfill your physical activity needs without it being something that you dread. Four, stress management. This looks very different for everyone, but recognize that there are two types of stress. Good stress, the ones that make us get stronger and more resilient, and bad, toxic stress. Ones that chip at us and are more harmful for our health in the long run. Identify the negative stress and try to minimize them in your life. Number three, real time management. At the end of the day, time management is really just life management. When we hear the word time management, we get enamored with the latest productivity apps and life-changing habits. However, sexy tools or complicated systems don't make a difference unless we're making progress in the most important things in life. Here are two of my time management habits that have really helped me to manage my life. Number one, Ruthless prioritization. Effective time management is about doing everything. It is all about doing the most important things, which also means we're letting everything else that isn't number one on our list to drop to the sidelines. One of the most important exercises I do at the end of each day is to go through my to-do list and cut back on things I'm not going to focus on tomorrow. Essentially, what is my highest priority and what is not? This is very uncomfortable for many people because instead of seeing what they're going to focus on, they see all the items they can't do. 
We think, only if I can finish the first item bit quicker, I can get to these three other things. It won't take long, I can have five priorities tomorrow. But what happens oftentimes is that we do only three of the five things on our list and we feel like a failure. Or we do get to all five on our list, but we do them to a subpar level. When I was working with team members, this was one of the biggest challenges I had to navigate. In getting everyone to understand what we're going to not focus on and resetting expectation. Second habit, once we ruthlessly identify our priority, then ruthlessly focus. Not letting any distractions get in the way of me completing the task I set out as my number one priority. I turn off my phone notification, I close all my web browsers, I close my door, and I set myself an alarm. Most often 45 minute time increments. Then I don't stop my work until the alarm goes off. That's it. I use tools like my whiteboard, my Google Calendar, and my Task Tracker app to help me stay organized. But at the end of the day, these two habits are what I try to practice on a daily basis. And if I can do these two over and over again, each day for a long period of time, I notice myself making real progress. Number four, how to have a real conversation. We hear that networking is important. It's not what we know, but who we know. But how do we develop our network and do it effectively? For me, networking just comes down to making genuine relationships authentic friendships, both close and loose ones. And that all starts with being able to have a real conversation with people. One of my most favorite books on this topic is Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. There are tons of lessons from this book, but my favorite lesson to have a real conversation is this. Ruthlessly focus. Give exclusive attention to the person that you're speaking to. Have you ever had a conversation with someone who seems distracted? Not looking at you, but looking around? Or even when they're looking at you, you get a sense that they aren't really hearing what you're saying. They're so concerned with what they're going to say next, they aren't really listening to what you're saying. Or worse yet, they're looking for someone else to talk to. How do you feel after that engagement? Not good, right? This person violated one of the most fundamental principles of human interaction. Attention. They didn't give you the attention that you deserved. There is no secret sauce to having a real conversation, having people like you, or building your network of authentic relationships. Give exclusive attention to the person that you're speaking to. Make that person feel like they're the most important person in the room. Be interested. Genuinely listen and ask follow-up questions that the other person will enjoy answering. Encourage them to talk more about themselves and their accomplishments. And don't be surprised if after the talk, they consider you the most interesting conversationist they met in their lives when you barely did any of the actual talking. Number five, how to really get a job. Coming out of college, we think getting a job is to submit as many of our resumes to as many companies as possible and see what sticks. We see so many tips on how to write the perfect resume, the eye-catching cover letter, and the most beautiful email for the hiring manager. But I'll tell you, even the best crafted resumes will not get you a job if you don't know how the whole hiring system works. Having worked in management for many years, I've screened my fair share of applicants, read thousands of resumes, and interviewed hundreds of individuals. And I'll tell you, your resume and your cover letter plays a very small part in actually getting the job. Let me share with you a few tips to increase your chance of getting that dream job of yours. Number one, even before you submit your resume, network with the people within the company. Look at your LinkedIn profile and see if you're connected in any ways to anyone working in a company you're interested in. It doesn't matter if it's your brother-in-law's former college roommate's younger sister and she just got hired three months ago. Ask for an introduction and an information interview. The hiring manager will be impressed by the fact that you know people within the company and more so that you spoke to them about either the company culture or the organizational goals. Second, research the company. Really try to understand how the company is structured, what its core business is, as well as its challenges. You don't have to be an expert at the company, but you want to be able to ask intelligent questions. When I was interviewing people for a position, I was always shocked how many people didn't really understand what the company actually did. Third, prepare for the interview. Interviews are just really role play. The interviewer has a set of questions and they expect a certain set of answers. It's not a time to be open about your life aspirations or your deepest life secrets. The interviewer doesn't care. Before you go to the job interview, look up possible questions and rehearse with the friend. And actually rehearse your answers. Don't just think it. Do you think actors just read the lines in their head before going to a casting? Don't think you'll suddenly be brilliant during the interview when you haven't actually practiced what you're going to say. Also last tip, don't talk about what the company can do for you. Your answer should always be in the form of what value you can provide for the company. Which leads to the next lesson college doesn't teach you. Number six, how to really work. When you're hired by a company, big or small, they're hiring you for a specific purpose, to add value and maximize their bottom line. It isn't just about doing what the boss tells you to do. Though it can start out that way, to really make yourself shine above everyone else, you want to have an owner mindset, not an employee mindset. An owner is always looking at the business with the lens of improving and maximizing the bottom line. An employee is looking at the business with the lens of just receiving a paycheck. I'm not saying you should sacrifice everything for the company because that is asking too much for any individual. But if you want to make yourself shine above everyone else, you don't want to just do what's on the syllabus as you learned in college. Look at the company operation and see what can be improved on. 
What can be optimized? What can maximize this bottom line? This is of real value because most people don't approach their work in this way. Some of you guys might hear this and may think, well, this isn't my company. What should I spend my precious bandwidth thinking about adding value beyond my immediate job description? I'm just going to do the bare minimum that's within my job scope. You can, but let me tell you what you're giving up. Leverage. When you can add real value, you now have leverage. Leverage you can use to negotiate a better salary, better working hours, and even craft your perfect custom job. Well, however, let's say that even when you can leverage yourself to an ideal working condition, you still aren't satisfied. Then what? This is where the next lesson comes in. Number seven, how not to get a job. Colleges at the end of the day are made for very traditional pathways. You get a specific degree, and you get a specific job within a specific industry, an accountant, an engineer, or a nurse. All excellent career paths, but how about if you don't want to follow a traditional career path? Then what do you do? Well, your college counselor has no idea. We're living at a time where non-traditional pathways are becoming more and more common. With the advent of technology, new industries and new career fields that weren't imaginable before are popping up left and right. I mean, just look at YouTube. I decided to upload my first YouTube video two years ago. At the time, there were no formal courses to become a YouTuber. No certification, no training. You just looked at what other YouTubers were doing and try to mimic them. And after a lot of trial and error, you somewhat find your path. You develop your video editing skills by editing a lot of very bad videos. You learn to film by filming a lot of bad takes. I know this very well. Just look at my videos from a year ago. I feel like throwing up every time I see them. I feel like such pathways will become more and more common in the near future. So we'll need to learn on our own how to carve our own pathway in an industry or a marketplace not yet fully developed. I'm still trying to figure it out, so I don't have a tons of advice in this area, except to say don't be afraid to try. If a middle-aged man who bought his first camera at the age of 40 could learn to film and edit videos for someone younger and more talented than I, the world is your oyster if you have the will and desire. Number eight, how to manage the chaos of life, or better yet, the chaos of our mind. One of my favorite quotes on this topic is this, life's greatest battles are fought within the silent chambers of the mind. Essentially, we don't learn the skills to manage the chaos of our minds in college. Life is chaotic. Things will never work out as planned. We'll get fired from a job. We'll lose friends. We will feel like we never accomplished much in our life. And if we let the negative thoughts run wild, it will wreak havoc in our minds. It will take us down to dark places. It will keep us from being able to move forward in positive ways. Stuff will always happen to us. But what matters is how we choose to respond. Do we let it overtake us? Or do we choose to reframe and come out stronger on the other end? Some of the exercises that help me to find the silent battles in my mind are as follows. One, write down what I'm thankful for. Even if it's just one sentence, when I see on paper what I have to be thankful for, the glass gets half full, not half empty. Two, read regularly. Fiction or nonfiction, it doesn't matter. Regularly reading about the world takes my mind away from myself. I'm not only learning something new, it helps me to see how small I am in this big world. Three, don't take myself so seriously. I don't need to be the best in everything. I like the challenge, but that doesn't mean I need to come first place every time. Life is a long marathon, not a short sprint. Managing the battles in our mind and thus the chaos of our life is a lifelong process. So don't expect you'll get this overnight. You may overcome today's challenges, but you will face new ones tomorrow. The difference is you're better equipped to face the new, bigger challenges because you're stronger. Number nine, how to reinvent ourselves. Reinvention is an interesting concept. We naturally don't think like this. We want certainty in our lives. So we go to college, get a good degree, and ultimately a good job so we never have to think about a new career again. But the world is constantly changing, and it will change faster in the future. What we know today will quickly become obsolete tomorrow. The leading industries of the present will disappear in the future. So we have to get good at reinventing ourselves, following our curiosities, constantly shedding our current self and embracing a newer version of ourselves, a version that is fraught with uncertainties and unknowns. Dwayne Johnson, aka The Rock, reinvented himself multiple times from a football player a wrestler to a Hollywood actor. Steve Martin reinvented himself from a stand-up comedian to a big screen actor to a banjo player. These are extreme examples, but we all do this to an extent. We reinvented ourselves from a student to our working occupation. We reinvented ourselves from being single to being married. And we reinvented ourselves from being a mother to being a grandmother. The key is not to be afraid of the unknown. The art of reinvention is a muscle that any one of us can develop if we get into practice of doing more and more of it. Number 10, how to design our life. Our ideal life. How many of us have given much thought to lifestyle design? Thinking through what do I love doing and what do I dread? And how do I design a life where I can do more of what I love and less of what I don't? For most of us, probably never. 
I sure never did until well into my 30s. Lifestyle design wasn't even a vocabulary that I was aware of. But if you think about it, it is one of the most crucial exercises we can do for our happiness. We don't want to just live a life responding to life's expectations. What my boss wants from me, my spouse or my kids. We want to be the captain of our lives, steering it intentionally in the direction that is most optimal for life satisfaction. And this is where thinking through our life design is so important. When you can clarify what your ideal day or week can look like, you have a concrete target you can shoot for. When I did this exercise recently, a few of the core activities that rejuvenated me were these. Purposeful work, exercise, family time. And a few of the activities that really drained me were these. And please don't judge me on these. Outdoor household chores like gardening, washing my car, and social media. So when I came up with my ideal day and week, I prioritized more time on the activities that excited me, and I outsourced or minimized activities that drained me. Don't blindly respond to life's expectations. Spend the time to think through your recurring activities and figure out ways to either do more or less of something. And know that this will change and should change with time. Your ideal day when you're 25 should look very different when you're 45. So you might be thinking at this point, it sounds like college doesn't teach us anything. So why even go? Well, I only cover what it didn't, but there are actually a lot that it does. One, it gives you marketable skills for the traditional work pathway. That is, if you get the right degree. Second, if you're leaving home for the first time, it pushes you out of your comfort zone. Third, it provides a base for your initial professional network. It shouldn't end with your college roommate, but you'll at least know some people when you enter the workforce. So the big question for me, knowing what college doesn't teach us, would I encourage my kids to attend college in the future? The honest answer is I don't know. That is the pathway I took, so that is what I think is right, but the world is constantly changing. And honestly, college shouldn't be the place where we learn everything we need to be prepared for adult life. That is asking way too much. But regardless, I'll let you know in 10 years what we decide. Thank you guys for watching. In the line of life lessons, if you'd like to learn about 10 greatest personal finance life lessons that changed my life, please check out my video here. Until next time, all the best.